around it. It will, before it gets to the vent, go over there and fill that dry spot up and you would actually see a little line of air bubbles going right to the vent. In conventional RTM, we had a dry spot. The resin, once it finds its way to the vent, it never looks back. It's out. Well, what would we do back then? We open the mold up, mix up a little resin, pour it on that dry spot area, close the mold back down and re-squeeze it, we'd call it. You may save the part, you may not, but you've lost a molding cycle for one and you've likely sacrificed the part in the end anyway. Far less scrap in a converging path. And fundamentally, that's the big difference. So, how do we maintain that push towards the center? Remember I described as the front leading edge of the resin has to have resistance. That's the key. So we get that first off by having accurate molds. If our mold starts out 120 but it goes over here it's 160, 180, 110, the resin's going to flow even in a converging path is going to flow to the area of least resistance at least at first. So oh yes there's tricks. On a vent here you can put a patch of glass right under the vent. So when the resin gets to it, if it did get ahead, again, a little more resistance, a little, little more in the very front edge, slow it down, forcing it to go back and look where it's missed. Well, you do that, no doubt. However, we talked about loading the glass into the radiuses. This is why. We don't want the resin to racetrack up that corner and say, well, heck, I could, I'm not going to go through that bend of resin there. I'm going to go through the outer radius around it and never build pressure, back pressure in there. So that's the key. Understanding what makes the air leave is this simple. The air within the cavity will remain in the cavity. The two will cohabitate. I'm probably find the part here, we got them all over the classroom, where there'll be air, little air bubbles. Maybe something large like a worm ran through the edge, we call it worming in the radiuses, or like you may not see in the camera, but there are a few air bubbles in this back laminate here. Well that's caused by the fact that the air within the cavity was not encroached on by the resin. The pressure of the resin didn't try to compress the bubble of air or the pocket of air. What happened then is the resin's flowing, the air's in there, and the air's saying, well come on by, I'm okay, as long as you don't crush me, we'll just stay in here together. And you pull the part out of the mold and sure enough the air is in the radius or it's wherever. Now again, it's not completely dry white glass, but there's air in it. Now it may be on the gel coat side, so there you got a gel coat repair. On the back side it may tend to crack with flexing. What we want again is the fiber to fill it. That's what takes care of that problem. But understanding what's going on. If the air is not compressed, then the air stays. But the moment you try to change the pressure of the atmosphere of that bubble, that's when the action occurs. So the resin coming in flows around the bubble or stays right behind the bubble pushing it. Pushing it straight to the point where it knows, well look, I'm getting encroached on by all this incoming resin, but there's a vent hole right over there. That's lower pressure. So inherently it goes to the lower pressure point. So when we've got this converging path, we've trapped the air. That's the fundamental difference. Now, as it compresses that air, as I've described, it goes right out the vent. So, how do we do that? Well, accurate tool I keep coming back to, most critical. Second, fiber that fills the, the cross section of the laminate. Today we're blessed with these chopped materials. This one happens to be chopped fiber, a knitted fiberglass center and chop. It could be a, a felt-like material in the middle, but the beauty of all these materials that are out there are the loft, the fluffiness, the ability to fill the mold cross-sectionally to create that damming effect, but yet not so much damming that we can't get through it. Because if it was to stop the resin, well then we've got the hydraulic pressure of the resin opening the mold up, totally obliterating our accuracy issues that we work so hard to achieve. So it's a combination of being able to control the speed the resin's coming in in harmony with the resistance of the fiber. So what you need is first a fiber that will fill. If I have 120 thousandths laminate, I can't put in a material that's only 30, 40 thousandths thick. It won't fill the part cross-sectionally. 
That's why we don't use cloth all alone, typically, in light RTM or even in conventional RTM. If we do, we have to calibrate the tool precisely to the thicknesses of the cloth. And wherever there's an overlap, we had to calibrate in for that overlap. What we want are materials that have give, just as we're showing here, that can compress and expand as needed. So if you had an overlap, a minor overlap, you can't have four or five overlaps here, you're going to fill the mold cavity right up. Because at 30% by weight fiber, you're about 17% by volume. So we can tolerate an overlap, it's still roughly a third of the mold laminate thickness. But the material will compress in that area. Where there isn't an overlap, it's still got enough loft to touch both halves of the mold. Fundamental. And then shape size, this is, we use this in the class often, is because it's a small part but simple in the sense that we have to fill it and fit it into these corners and sorts. So it's a great learning tool. The, the point then is the materials will tend to stretch. Now we can't stretch them too far or we lose their weight variance per square inch or square foot, meter, however you want to evaluate that, but, but they take shape. It's a godsend. You know, 20 years ago, so many projects would have been 10 times easier if we could have formed the glass and had memory to stay there. It's beautiful. All right. So we're filling the mold, beginning with having loaded the glass properly, tight into the radiuses, closed the mold down, brought it under vacuum level inside the cavity. Remember the perimeter clamping area is under the highest vacuum. We're talking about RTM light because frankly 99 point some percent or in the high 90s applications today are served most practically with the light RTM which I've said to you, you call it what you want. The big difference is the converging flow path allowing us to take advantage of vacuum for clamping, for assisting in differential pressures in the cavity, and enabling us, the most important thing, that we have a converging path to the center vent. So we've closed the mold, we've clamped the vacuum around the perimeter, we've pulled our half at least of the atmosphere out inside the cavity, now we begin the injection. So every piece of injection equipment, if properly designed, will give you control of your flow rate. Pressure alone, that's back where we were 2001, 2003, the zip technology. We said zero injection pressure gained atmosphere. In other words, if we're injecting into the mold, remember we had that 14.7 PSI in the beginning. We pump half of that atmosphere out, we still got 7 PSI of clamping force to deal with. That means when we inject, if we stay within that 7 psi pressure, well, we would never open the mold up. And in principle and practicality, that's true. But we can't control by pressure alone. What we control by is flow rate. Because if we're working ourselves right up to that limit all the time, we're often going to open the mold. What we do now is we control to a flow rate that we prescribe that will fill the mold without overpressurizing it. And then our machine has to re act to a pressure limit. So you set a limit, let's say we set the limit at 1.2 bar, we begin injecting and we then stay underneath that limit but we flow at oh one liter, two liters a minute, depending on the size part, fiber load and such, we help prescribe that for you. So we give you a flow rate and a pressure limit. Now you inject at that flow rate consistently, never exceeding the limit, you have a very, very consistent product. And if your machine, like our PRG, our programmable machine, it allow you to even step that at different rates. So on the, the, when you're filling the largest area, obviously you can fill faster. So in the beginning you fill faster. As it's becoming closer and closer to the end of the fill, you slow down. Or you in, change the sensitivity of pressures. But you have that ability to tailor the, the injection flow rate. That's the critical key. So in summary, vacuum won't suck the air out like a vacuum cleaner. It also will not take the air out once the mold is filled. Just leaving the vacuum on and thinking it's going to suck the bubbles out inside the mold cavity won't happen. The, the advantage of vacuum works during the dynamic of the fill and it works to help influence the air by maintaining a lower atmospheric pressure at the vent and when the air is being encroached on, whereas if it were allowed to be encroached, it's atmospheric pressure. The bubble, the air within the cavity, would have to go up. You're compressing it. 
it doesn't want that, it inherently then goes to that low vacuum or the low pressure area at the vacuum vent. That's the key. Hope that helped you understand just how the air is leaving the mold. Any of your other questions, please send them to us. We, uh, we welcome that. That's where we come up with these. These are questions that are asked to us quite often. Uh, you can submit that to info at jhmtechnologies.com <clears throat> or uh, info at rtmcomposites.com. Thank you for your interest today. Hope you enjoyed the video.